Good afternoon for three appeals on this afternoon's calendar. Starting with appeal number 18, Toussaint versus Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. Good afternoon, Your Honors. Uh, may it please the court. My name is Good Andrew Good afternoon, Dean. counsel. Let's just wait a moment uh, until your colleague arrives on the screen. Okay, wonderful. Good afternoon, counsel. This is appeal number 18, Toussaint versus Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. Counsel? Yes, and may it please the court. Um, my name is Andrew Dean, and I represent defendant appellant, the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. Um, I respectfully request two minutes for rebuttal. You may have your two minutes for rebuttal. Mr. Dean, is your argument that there's no vicarious liability because there's no breach of the designation requirement and the accident was um, entirely unforeseeable or is it that there is at the least the question of fact on whether the duty to keep the work site was breached as a consequence of uh, uh, the gentleman, Mr. Melvin, uh, jumping on the buggy and moving the buggy? Well, Your Honor, my, my first argument is that the industrial code provision at issue 23-9.9a is not sufficiently specific to support a 241-6 claim. And that's a novel issue. And that is why we are before this court to decide that issue. Our, our, our second question is mm -hmm. yes, um, that this incident was unforeseeable as a matter of law and that the defendant, the Port Authority can raise any valid defense um, to a 241-6 claim, including uh, respondent superior um, that um, this particular incident occurred outside of the scope of this gentleman's, Mr. Mel Melvin's uh, uh, duties on the work site. He was supposed to be working on the south side of the work site. Our plaintiff was working on the north side of the work site um, and that we did not violate the provision Judge, at issue because- Judge, if you are- Judge Fahey, Fahey please. Uh, Mr. Dean. Judge Fahey. Yes, thank you, Judge. Uh, Mr. Dean, you say this regulation isn't specific enough. I, I want to ask you a question about your first point. Um, sure. Uh, as I understand it, uh, the, the regulation designated a particular person, said this person uh, uh, had to be designated, which and also trained the way I, I read the regs, and that it applied to power buggies. What language do you think you'd have to put in the reg to make it specific enough? Um, uh, how could it be more specific? Well, that's a great question, Your Honor. And um, I, I would state that there is um, case law that has held well, that. Give me an example of a reg that you think is sufficiently specific and uh, uh, that we could look to to compare to this reg. Uh, sure. Um, whether scaffolding um, is required to be um, 2.5 inches thick um, to, to be a correct scaffolding, or if the provision required an affirmative duty on the part of the defendant to conduct inspections. This provision just said only a trained um, and competent individual designated by the employer shall operate a power buggy. And the case law has held that those exact that exact language has been deemed well, too general. The, so the I read if there's it, an affirmative read, duty, yeah. then you, you, it, it is specific. Um, well, it's specific to power buggies. We all agree on that, right? It specifically requires that the individual has to be trained in the operation of those buggies. And, then, and by designated, it means that the individual has to be designated by the employer to operate it. What else would you add to that, Reg, to make it more specific? 
that there there would have to be some affirmative action. Um, the provision contains no concrete I, I'm mandate. I'm confused as by to, that. Tell me what you mean by that. The, there's no there's no um, language in the provision that says what makes this individual um, competent. There's no language as to what makes the individual trained. If, if I may, uh, trained and competent are not really defined and designated by itself uh, doesn't guarantee that one can safely operate the buggy. Um, it's just a matter of who the employer has chosen. Um, so, I mean, is, is that your point? Uh, well, the, the point is that the, the union rules required um, laborers to operate these power buggies. We had a laborer foreman, Joe DeRosa, um, who designated his laborer, um, Paul Estavio, um, to operate this power buggy. The fact that Mr. Melvin just decided, you know, while he was walking to his employer's um, office during his lunch break to just hop on this buggy and drive it into the plaintiff without well, any... Um, how is this less... Um, uh, Judge Stein? I'm sorry. How is this less specific than um, the what we held to be sufficient in Masiki, um, which referred to um, uh, uh, being um, I'm sorry being designated uh, to uh, that that the servicing and and repair of defective equipment shall be performed by or under the supervision of a designated person. We said that was sufficient. How is this yeah. different? It's distinguishable, Your Honor, because Misiki dealt with a three sentence provision. The first two of those sentences were deemed too general to support a labor law 241 6 claim. Um, the third sentence, which required, again, affirmative action to correct um, structural defects and conditions, was sufficient, uh, sufficiently specific. The first two, which um, the first sentence uh, was that the machine should be operated in good repair to general. The second sentence that proper equipment should be utilized was to general. The third sentence requiring correcting structural defective conditions required affirmative action. And that's why it was deemed specific. Here we're dealing with a single sentence provision without any punctuation that just said only trained uh, operators, competent operators designated by the employer shall operate power buggies. So we're not dealing with the three sentence provision like we were dealing with in Missouri. So we can parse uh, sentence by sentence, but we can't parse within sentence. Is that your, is that your uh, position? To an extent, yes. I mean, um, the legislature uh, wrote this provision, did not include any punctuation, did not um, deem it uh, a requirement that you had to define trained, you had to define competent, or you no, had to I'm define assuming, designated. I'm assuming that those words are, are not general, are, are general, but I, I guess my question is, is whether the requirement that the person be designated, isn't that an affirmative action? Well, we would argue that um, we, we, we did designate a person. We had our labor foreman, um, DeRosa, who appointed his laborer, uh, Mr. Estavio, to operate the power buggy. So in terms of applicability, we, we, we definitely may, complied with the statute. Let me ask a question, Judge, Judge if I may. Rivera? Yes, yeah, so I want to ask you about that, uh, Mr. Dean. It's certainly something that uh, Mr. Shute raised in his briefing. Why, why isn't the question about uh, Estavio? He's a designated person. And then it's unclear what, if anything, he does to prevent Melvin from getting on this buggy, which, as I understand the record, but you will correct me if I'm wrong, uh, the buggy is actually on and it doesn't take anything to get in and get it going. So the person who is the, the designated individual, who you're saying is the correct person to be behind the buggy, left it running. Why, why isn't the case really about that? 
Well, he actually didn't left it running. Uh, if, if you look at the testimony, um, he had to actually uh, undo the brake. But this incident, and there is actually well, a no, video. But the, the buggy is running. It's got a brake on, which takes nothing to remove, right? Yeah, he had to um, pre press down the brake and, you know, get the, it into the motion. En the engine is running. It's not that it's been turned off if he had finished. Yes, but the, there is a video that and it, it also goes back to the plaintiff's testimony as to how quick this accident happened. So in their briefing uh, opposing our appeal, um, they have argued that why didn't um, uh, Mr. Stavio tackle the uh, Mr. Melvin and get him off of the buggy. But there is actually a video um, that was not included in the record because there was a, a motion practice related to the video that just shows how quick this accident happened. Um, it so was literally it, why is like it a matter of seconds. Yeah, so why isn't it a fact question that goes to the trier of fact? Well, if, if, if we don't reach the issue of specificity and we don't reach, reach the issue of unforeseeability, the Supreme Court actually ruled that there was a question of fact of whether um, Mr. Melvin was acting within the scope of his employer or whether he was engaged in horseplay. And that's why our summary judgment motion was denied um, by Judge Kotler in the Supreme Court. And um, now we're faced with this issue that the plaintiff is raising that this issue is not preserved um, or reviewable by this court um, to the extent the first two issues are not considered by this court or denied by this court. And um, uh, Judge Smith in the um, Hecate case, uh, excuse me if I'm... Hecker. Yeah. Um, Hecker. Hecker. Yeah, excuse me, um, you know, ru ruled that it, it actually um, benefits a plaintiff who did not preserve the issue and um, leaves us in this position where upon a search of the record by the first department, even though we preserved our appellate rights, um, that were not an issue to, we can't argue this, um, even though we did everything we could to get to the court of appeals. Um, and, uh, Judge Smith, um, did write that, you know, this is, a, um, Chief an issue Smith. that should be considered by this court. Um, and I believe this is a case that it should be. Mr. Dean, how, how do we get around Pecker? Um, you know, it, so as you say, Judge Smith, uh, pointed out, uh, some seeming or arguable unfairness about the rule, but that was apparently the rule that the court uh, set down. So are you asking us to overrule that case or, uh, and, and on what basis would we do that? Uh, I'm, I'm asking this court that we don't even need to get there, that this uh, industrial code provision is not sufficiently specific. But if we and... disagree with you on that point, it, it, hypothetically, if we do, then yes, I, I would argue that this court should reconsider the Heckert decision and um, not not grant a plaintiff uh, the benefit of the doubt where they refuse to um, or neglected to um, preserve the issue for an appellate review, whereas we did. Chief, if I may, I- Judge uh, Feynman? Yeah. Um, so getting to the scope of employment argument that you're making as an alternative argument, um, my understanding is um, that the duty here under 241 sub six, if we were to find that the right was specific, uh, is, is non-delegable. Um, and, and so I'm not really sure when you say scope of employment, what you actually mean, uh, are you saying that Melvin was a participant or not a participant in the construction project uh, when he jumped onto the buggy? I mean, I understand he was assigned to a different part of the project. Uh, and and yeah, you just uh, explain that uh, argument a little better to me. 
Okay, so I, I believe the case law is clear that an owner can raise any valid defense to liability under 241.6, included, including contributory and comparative negligence. And under Gordon, um, you're only liable for foreseeable consequences of your actions. Um, here we have an it, well, but that's a intervening act that I mean, is a superseding uh, cause of liability. Uh, I, I'm, you know, I understand the argument about foreseeability, but I'm not sure what that has to do with scope of employment. Well, M Mr. Melvin was uh, a, an oiler for a crane on the south side of the Oculus project, which is that right. so, so alien looking project, right? Uh huh. And, and, and Mr. Toussaint him. was working on the north side of the project on Fulton Street. They had nothing to do with each other. Um, he was not uh, permitted per union rules to operate a power buggy. We had um, designated persons who were permitted to operate the power buggy labor for Well, well that, that really mentioned. goes to your foreseeability and, you know, how, is it foreseeable that somebody's going to jump on and go for a joy ride? But, um, uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm not sure I follow the scope of employment argument. Um, but getting back to the specificity, uh, um, uh, I am curious to, if, if you could further elucidate the response, I think, to uh, the, the initial set of questions by uh, Judge Fahey as to what additional requirements uh, you would need um, and, and why this is not just a, a general command. Well, I, I would argue that um, uh, under the court's precedent, under stare decisis, um, in the Wilkie case, 23-9.6C, uh, requiring specifically that aerial baskets operators, quote, shall be competent designated persons who have been trained in the operation and use of such equipment was not specific. So there we have precedent that requires a specific piece of equipment, um, the same exact language that we're dealing with in 23-9.9a, and it was ruled too general to support a 20, uh, 241.6 claim. You um, know, uh, there's a, it, it's, it's all right, Judge, if I ask a question. Yes, please. There, there's a, a number of cases that may go both ways on, on this issue. I think it's a, um, one of the things that the court may consider is uh, how do we establish some test for specificity um, in this context? One of the things that strikes me is uh, um, uh, you could say something, I think like a, uh, uh, a reg that conditions performance with a particular task, that will be operation here, that would be the particular task on a particular device that would be specific. Here we have a specific device, a power buggy, by a particular person. That would be the designated person here that was designated by the employer um, with particular preparation, and that would be training. Um, I think uh, courts sometimes struggle on, on the issue of specificity, and um, um, we, we may have to give them more guidance on it, but it seems even if uh, we, we outline a test in the fashion that I've done that this reg would meet those tests or, or those requirements. Um, but uh, um, I can see where, where there's confusion in the bar uh, between uh, both plaintiffs and defendants and the courts on the issue of specificity here. And maybe in this case, we can seek to address that. Thank you, counsel. Mr. Shu. Thank you, Your Thank Honor. You. Uh, we have Base, three basic points. One, this particular regulation 9.9 .9 subdivision A set forth the specific standard of conduct within the meaning of the Court of Appeals precedents, which I hope to get to in just a second. Two, the various arguments for non unforeseeable as a matter of law, supposedly not within the scope of Melvin's employment, uh, lack merit for reasons I hope to get to. And three, to the extent it's reviewable, 
the grant of summary judgment by the appellate division majority uh, was plainly correct because there's no issue of fact that makes a difference in resolution of the motion. Let me start with 9.9a. We know from amongst other places, uh, Judge Re Rivera's decision in, in Morris, the legislative intent of this statute is to quote, ensure the construction sites. We know from this court's decision in Ross and Rizzuto, more recently in uh, Morris and St. Louis, that you have a dichotomy here. And the dichotomy is on the one hand, does the regulation set forth a, as it was framed in St. Louis, a specific standard of conduct, or on the other hand, simply a recitation of common law safety principles. And in the latter case, it's not sufficient to give rise to liability. So Chief, and if I might interject there. Yes, Your Honor. Just wanna make sure it's okay with the Chief, who seems to be frozen. Judge Wilson, yes, please. Oh, sorry. Um, what is yes. it that mm -hmm. this particular regulation adds in your view over the common law? Well, it's completely different, Your Honor, than say operating the machine safely uh, because you have a machine that's operated safely by someone who's not designated or trained to use it. You could have someone who's trained and designated to use it who operates it unsafely, either way. It's something completely different and I'm not aware of any common law requirement that for a specific type of machine designate uh, the user, any common law requirement. I would add that here we have a regulation. No person other than a trained and competent operator designated by the employee shall operate a power buggy. Well, would it, would it not be negligent to designate somebody who is not trained and competent? Wouldn't that just be ordinary negligence? Well, Your Honor, if, if, if the fact that it was negligent ruled out a violation, uh, then you'd have virtually no liability. In many instances, violating a regulation would be negligent, but there's no requirement to designate an individual in common law. But even if there were, Your Honor, take a look at in Rizzuto. So the then I'm sorry, so then would, would, would a regulation that simply said designate an individual, that is specific enough? designated individual, I think it would be. This is more specific than that. But Your Honor, if, to, your, to your question, the regulation- Well, what I'm, I'm, uh, if I may, Chief, um, what I'm, uh, following up on Judge uh, Wilson's questions, I'm, I'm not sure how being designated by itself guarantees uh, one that uh, can safely operate the buggy. Um, I, I'm still not sure how that's, a specific safety precaution. Uh, Your Honor, it doesn't guarantee that the person can operate the buggy. Being Having a driver's license doesn't op mean that you can safely operate the car, particularly if the driver happens to be drunk at that time. But the point is, you certainly will globally across the state. I think it's obvious have fewer accidents if the people who are operating these machines, and remember, of all these power operated equipments that are collectively covered by 23-9, uh, uh, all of them, the commission has singled out only three machines, uh, aerial baskets, excavators, and this, power buggies, um, as one that particularly required a designated uh, operator. If, if, all right, so the regulation says trained, uh, a, a trained and competent operator designated by the employer. Uh, if it did not say a trained and competent operator, just said something, uh, you know, uh, again, following up on Judge Wilson's question, uh, it just said uh, the power buggies can be operated by a designated employee, uh, you know, an operator designated by the employer. Your argument is that that would be specific enough. Uh, yes, and the uh, commissioner could, could include reasonably uh, that that would reduce the incidence of accidents. All right. Um, but to um, your point, if what I, if it said uh, trained and competent, but didn't say designated by the employer? I don't know, Your Honor. I think that would still be specific enough, and I'll tell you why. Um, in Rizzuto, the regulation you looked at was 1.7D. It 
requires that it, it forbids slippery places on walk. We have an argument about what is slippery. Can people define it differently? Sure. Uh, but what this court said is that regulation was, quote, precisely the type of concrete specification that Ross requires. If this regulation, one only type of equipment, a specific safeguard, the person uh, violating it, uh, rather operating it, uh, should be designated, trained, and competent. Even if you could imagine cases where you can have a factual issue, is that person trained, is that competent, were they designated? It doesn't alter the fact that, that that's just as specific as 1.7D. And here, we, I have an issue as to whether this individual was sufficiently trained, sufficiently competent, uh, competent sufficiently designated. Chief, if, if I might. Um, Judge Wilson. Mr. Shute, the, the um, identification of a specific type of equipment, power buggy, seems to me to be somewhat undercut by the court's holding in St. Louis, which says, you don't look at the name of the vehicle or, or what it's, how it's described, you look at its function. And at least as I understand a power buggy, it's to move things around a construction site, which then sort of erodes some of the specificity uh, as to the type of the vehicle, because you could use all kinds of things to move heavy things around a construction site. And I think you probably frequently do. Your Honor, the reason uh, for that holding in St. Louis State of Right in the decision itself uh, was that because the purpose of the statute and of the regulations enacted there under is to promote safety the contrary interpretation in that case, which would go the other way, should be rejected. Here, again, it's clear which interpretation, if we even go that far, promotes safety. We talk in our brief, they talk in their brief, a great deal about the appellate division authority. By the way, that case cited the case from 2000. In fact, there are more than 10 industrial code provisions, which in some combination uh, require a person performing a particular activity to be designated and or competent uh, and or trained, more than 10. Seven of those designated uh, of those provisions have been deemed valid predicates. Um, I won't cite them, they're in my brief. Three of them, including two of them relied upon the defendants Go the op go. Uh, they are seemingly conflicting opinions, which may not actually be conflicting. For a minute, I'll I'll, I'll, I'll get to that. Only two. Um, that's nine point six C one and seven point three E, have actually consistently been deemed inadequate. But uh, but consistently is not perhaps the best word, since in each case, it's each regulation. It's one case. And it goes defendant's way. And one of those cases is a trial of a case. But to, to my point, Your Honor, and your questions earlier about uh, same sentence or different sentence, one reason I think for this split in authority is because oftentimes, for example, with not one which governs all power equipment, you have combined in the same sentence. There you have one sentence that says, all power equipment used in construction, demolition, and excavation operations shall be operated only by trained designated persons. And this is still the same sentence. All such equipment shall be operated in a safe manner at all times. The latter part of that sentence is the classic common law uh, recitation. But what's happened is in the first case that dealt with this regulation, the Bird case, third department case, we show pages 44 to, uh, 40 to 44 of our brief, but where the case involved safe operation or alleged unsafe operation. There was no claim that the individual who operated the, uh, the I forgot what the device was, forklift, um, was not designated or trained to operate it. Berg said, this is not specific enough which was, a, I think, a valid holding based upon what the claim was. But then because it didn't say in the opinion itself, the third department opinion, we're looking at the second part. What happened is every appellate division decision thereafter cites Berg, nothing else, and says this has been deemed insufficiently precise. And clearly it should be uh, one way or the other, whether there's a period in between the first half of the sentence and the next. In either case, the second half of the sentence, whether it's a new sentence or a continuation of the first, should be deemed inadequate. 
the first half of the sentence or if it's a man. Judge Feynman. Um, so I, I want to change gears for a second, Mr. Shute, and I just want to understand the framework that you think we need to be analyzing the specificity requirement. And by that, I mean, uh, you know, uh, do we look at Ross uh, as the controlling case? Um, obviously, there are other subsequent cases, uh, such as Rizzuto, Morris, and Masicki. But um, uh, you're not asking, and I don't think your adversary is asking, uh, for us to overrule Ross as an unworkable framework. Uh, no, I think that ship has passed a long time ago, um, Your Honor. It's uh, maybe not the, uh, the, the holding that some of us in, in the bar would have guessed, but I mean, that ship has passed. The answer is no. Um, if I can briefly go to the might I, just before we're on that subject, might I just ask you uh, something if for no other reason than my own intellectual curiosity. There is a whole strain of cases, of our cases, that long predate Ross and then continue beyond it, that make a distinction between uh, statutes that impose a duty, uh, which the first five subsections of, of uh, 241 do, and regulations. And at least as I read those cases, they say if it's a statute, the duty is non-delegable, that's the end of it. If it's a regulation, however, the regulation can be introduced as evidence of negligence. Um, but I don't see where there's a holding in that, in that line or really anywhere else that says, and if the regulation is less than specific, you lose your 241.6 claim. Can you shed any light on that? Am I misunderstanding something? Um, uh, I, as I understand it, that's the whole bit of Ross, that uh, we only consider those, we, the Court of Appeals, of course, only consider those regulations which mandate a specific code of conduct as opposed to a recitation of common law principles. There's nothing prior to Ross, I think, that mandates that conclusion. Ross did, uh, looking at it at that point in time, and in Division Six. It doesn't say thou shalt comply with regulations. It says there shall be reasonable and adequate protection and safety in the workplace, which the court feels they are construed to mean comply with the regulations, at least those that are specific. Um, judge, uh, may, may I ask a question? Uh, yes, Judge. I, I know we're getting near the end here. Thanks, Judge. Uh, um, Mr. Shute, turning to a different issue, I, I want to go back to the reviewability question for a second. Uh, you, you had cited Hecker, I believe. Um, amongst others, yes. Yeah, um, amongst others. Uh, eh, here's my problem with that case. Um, Hecker is kind of a classic reverse summary judgment question where uh, um, uh, uh, I think it was a court of claims case, if I'm right. And, uh, um, and then it was um, uh, the appellate division uh, uh, reached the issue on a reg that was cited in the bill of particulars and addressed in the motion court in court of claims. Um, and the, the appellate division reaches as an alternative ground upon which to grant the defendant's motion. And that was unreviewable by the court. That, that, that was Hecker. I get that. I, I understand the logic there. It, it's kind of an outlier, but um, I understand that. But th this really isn't, that's not the, really the situation here. Here we have uh, something uh, uh, different um, because uh, um, this uh, um, summary judgment issue was not raised in the lower court. Um, it wasn't reviewed by the motion court. And then the appellate division brought it up and um, uh, on their own volition, which they have a right to do, um, granted reverse summary judgment um, under 3212B, which by the way, Hecker didn't even make reference to 3212B, the CPLR. So, in that situation, there would be no review at all of the appellate division's decision. And we have some case law that goes the other way on that. Uh, it was a, a Judge K case. Uh, I think she wrote a decision on it uh, um, entitled JMD Holding Corp versus Con Congress Financial Corporation. It's a 2000, 2005 case that cited uh, Judge K uh, Merritt Hill Vineyards. Uh, versus Windy Hill Vineyard. It's a 1984 Court of Appeals case. Anyway, 
I know I can take you down that rabbit hole, uh, uh, shoot, because uh, you, you'll understand the cases as Mr. Dean will. But um, my simple point being there is her argument is that this has to be reviewable and, um, uh, and that Hecker doesn't really fall within that line of cases. And the line of cases I make reference to are still valid. And I'm wondering if we don't say this is reviewable, there will be no review at all of a, of a factual determination here. Go ahead. You and I take, uh, let me make two points with respect to that. One, it's not just Hecker. Uh, there have been four Court of Appeals decisions since 2013 all cited in my brief. Yeah, but let, let, me, just, let me just leave you on that. The cases aren't going to get you out of this discussion because I, I, I can name six in a row that go the other way. And I won't bore the court by reading them to you, but um, I'm concerned about reviewability, not just in this case, but as a principle. Um, so go ahead. Uh, let me put it this way, Orna. If you were writing on a blank slate and these decisions didn't exist, I actually think that Judge Smith's concurrence makes a lot more sense than the majority opinion. And uh, for that reason, let me address why, if you did get to the merits, um, you should affirm. Thank you. Issue of fact um, in terms of whether what actually preceded uh, Melvin's operation of this buggy, right? Um, was it uh, horseplay uh, or was he moving it out of the way? Or was he doing both? Um, they had to move the buggy out of the way and it was fun to do and he went on it. But regardless of how that's resolved, regardless of how that's resolved, it had to be moved out of the way. It's not just Melvin that says that, it's Estavio who says that, page 671, uh, 671 of the record. Two, you have a regulation which absolutely forbids except by a designated person, which the person is. Three, Melvin has no training whatsoever. And if you take a look, maybe the most important two pages of the record are pages 671 to 672, because that's, that's Estavio's made for the motion affidavit. And when you read that, and remember, plaintiff testified before this affidavit was made that the two of them, Melville, and, uh, Melvin rather, and Estavio, are both tooling around with this buggy before the incident. What you do not see at those that made for the motion affidavit is a denial talking crap and joking with Melvin beforehand, a denial that he personally was playing with the buggy beforehand, a denial that he was present throughout the entire event. And what you also don't see, Your Honor, is any claim that he made an attempt, I don't mean to tackle, um, made any attempt to do anything to stop Melvin while he, Melvin's in his immediate presence. There's no, and it's not a matter of what you believe or what you don't believe. There is no proof, which if believed, would lead you to that conclusion. It's just not there. I see. If I, I may, uh, the foreseeability, I'll be very brief and, and uh, beyond the scope of employment. Foreseeability, Please do. Your Honor? Please do. Thank you. Uh, with respect to foreseeability, uh, I cite in brief this court's decision in Sanchez versus State. If you have regulations, actually it was rules in that case, it's regulation in this case, that specifically foresee um, an occurrence, then it's foreseeable. The commissioner foresaw this when he said, this is one of the three uh, items, which for whatever reason, we're gonna tell you, you need someone designated and competent. There's a lot of power equipment at construction sites. Why this one? And uh, interestingly enough, my adversary says it's wrong to presume that the commissioner had some reason for this. Of course, when you go to the, the legislative history of these provisions, there isn't any. You might as well find the history of the Hammurabi Code. It's more available than that. But I think there was a reason for it. You can figure out what the reason was. Um, the employment argument, I would say, is number one, simply wrong legally, but also irrelevant. This court, again and again, um, uh, Lugrano was one of the cases cited in my brief. We have two gas jockeys, that's what the court called them, at a gas station, who are playing this game of flipping a, a match into a lighted can. 
and trying not to, to get it to explode, and it does explode. Um, and this court said injuries or deaths arising from employee horseplay are compensable under the workers' compensation law if they result from conduct which may be reasonably regarded as an incident to employment. That's carried over the tort cases too, and even including intentional torts like DeWall, this court's decision, where you have the uh, building going to collect the rent and it ends up in a fist fight. And of course his job wasn't to engage in the fist fight, but it arose from the employment. And here it's undisputed that that buggy had to be moved. But more importantly, Your Honor, it's a false issue. One of the regulations cited in our brief, uh, 1.29 uh, deals with flag people at the construction site. You have to have a flag person under certain conditions like if there's traffic in the area or if there uh, are a, a danger of, of equipment dropping, you have to have a flag person to control the traffic. What happens if it's violent? Typically, it's someone who's not employed at all at the site who comes in and smashes into the construction worker. For them, it certainly didn't occur within the scope of their employment. They're not even employed at the site. The issue isn't or shouldn't be uh, whether Melvin was acting within the scope of employment, although he was under this court's decisions. The issue should be uh, whether there was a violation of a regulation or if indeed whether the Estavio was acting in the scope of his employment. That's the issue. And in fact, if you take defendant's interpretation, there are two possibilities. A, the operator was designated, B, he was not. If he was designated, trained and competent, there's no violation. If he wasn't designated, then according to defendant, it's unforeseeable that, that it will occur and it didn't occur in the scope of the operator's employment. And so either way, there can never be an instance in which violation gives rise to liability. Uh, I suspect I've gone over my time and thank you very much, Your Honor. You're very welcome. Counsel? Uh, yes, just in a brief rebuttal, um, just uh, first in reference to the Sanchez case, which uh, the, the plaintiff cites for uh, foreseeability, that dealt with an inmate on inmate assault, which um, if I was in Rikers Island as a um, barely 165 pound uh, white male, I, I would foresee that I would be assaulted. Uh, on Rikers Island. So I think that's co completely distinguishable from the facts at issue. Um, as to the statute specificity, um, why didn't the legislature um, provide any details as to what, uh, when a, a, uh, an operator is deemed trained? Why didn't it provide any details as to when an operator is deemed competent? Um, and at the end of the day, we had, like I said, our laborer foreman designate a laborer per union rules that was permitted to operate this power buggy. And in the few seconds at issue, when Mr. Uh, Melvin jumped on the, um, uh, the power buggy, it was co completely unforeseeable to the Port Authority. And as the dissent noted, um, to impose, quote, to impose liability under these circumstances, and these facts would potentially expose a defendant to liability anytime an unauthorized person on his own initiative or even a trespasser moved such an item of equipment. And we submit that this provision was not uh, uh, specific. We submit that this accident was unforeseeable. Uh, Chief, if I may. Um, yes, Judge Feynman. So uh, while Mr. Shute was speaking, I happened to pull, reach up to myself and pull down the PJI. And there are almost a hundred pages worth of cases uh, going through regulation after regulation after regulation uh, to discuss uh, how uh, Ross applies uh, and whether or not this particular regulation is uh, specific or not. And I, and I guess what would be helpful to me uh, is regardless of whether we hold it is specific or not specific, um, what guidance can we give the courts in applying the framework of Ross, uh, you know, in terms of figuring out uh, whether the requirement of a specific regulation is satisfied? 
thank you, Judge Feynman. And I, I would say affirmative action, um, whether the statute or the provision, excuse me, requires an affirmative action on the part of the uh, employer, such as um, conducting inspections, such as requiring that scaffolding be of a specific measurement. Um, none of that is addressed in this specific code. And in fact, um, Chief, there are multiple mind. code provisions um, that it Chief. deal with this exact same language. Judge Wilson? So this goes back to a prior question. When you say affirmative action, why isn't it affirmative action to require the employer to train somebody? Why isn't it affirmative action to require the employer to designate somebody? Those seem like affirmative acts. The, the, I, I guess it's distinguishable, Your Honor, because there's no details requiring, um, there's no concrete mandate as to what deems the person um, trained. There's no details as to so what something, makes him competent. So something, something different from an affirmative action. It's a, an affirmative obligation placed on the employer to do ha something that has some what? Well, for, for example, like um, the, the inches requirement for scaffolding. Um, sure, it's easy to know, find, they, it's easy to come up with something that's sufficient, but sort of where is the line? Well, that's what we're asking this court uh, to address. Yeah, and, and, and Judge Conlon uh, was asking if you can articulate a, a line for us. And I don't think affirmative action does that. Uh, I, I would just argue that um, precedent under Wade v. Bovis, um, the court held that only trained designated persons shall operate personal hoist, not specific. Under Wilkie, 23-9.96C, uh, requiring aerial baskets, operators shall, quote, be competent designated persons who have been trained with the use of such equipment was not specific. And then we also have the Berg and Scott cases ruling that 23-9.2B1, applicable to power operated equipment generally, was too um, general to support Judge, the if I may, Judge, if I may ask. Judge Rivera. Thank you. So, uh, Mr. Dean, just staying on this, well, um, your client, well, the employer must have understood what this regulation meant, right? For Ostavio, they must know what training means. They must know what designation means, correct? Yeah, per, per union rules. Okay, so uh, let me ask this. How did the employer come to the conclusion that the union rules would meet the requirements of the code? Well, that was uh, per contract with the employer, SGS, um, who employed Mr. Estavio and employed um, Mr. Toussaint. So mm -hmm. um, he, he obviously was not supposed to be in that area. Uh, union rules said that um, only laborers could operate this piece of equipment. And um, it's so well I, known. With respect to the training, is, is the employer assuming because the union is handling this, that the union has properly trained them in accordance with whatever the code might require? Well, I, I think the, the provision is too general to even mandate what the Port Authority would, would know what is uh, specifically required. Yeah, but and, then, and then aren't you just saying that the employer doesn't know how to comply and they never did because they just don't know? No, I think they're requiring, uh, they're responding on the union rules um, that are applicable in the contracts with their subcontractor that they will comply with these rules. Are, are you saying then that there is the equivalent of a custom and practice about what is appropriate training for driving a power buggy? I, I would say that... Um, it, it was on the employer to designate uh, a specific person, which they did per union rules. Laborers are the ones that are going to operate these concrete power buggies. We had a laborer foreman who designated a proper laborer to operate the power buggy at issue. And the fact that this individual um, just took it upon himself to jump on the uh, power buggy and drive it into the plaintiff was completely unforeseeable. Thank you, counsel. Thank you. Thank you, your honors.